Will you please turn now into to your into, turn now in your Bibles to John chapter ten? We're going to read from verse 22 again to the end of the chapter and we're going to focus on the Lord's response to the unbelief of the Jews who pick up stones as we read in verse 31 to stone him. And we see that this of course is an occasion for the Lord to testify about himself and our focus is going to be on verse 36. The one the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world. That is the Lord Jesus' description of himself. And I wonder if you have ever thought about him in those terms. The very one who is more precious to the Father than anything else, whom he sent into the world for you. So let us now give careful attention to the reading of God's word. John 10, beginning at verse 22. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father sent as his very own? Sorry, what, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I am God's Son. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Well, let us ask the Lord very particularly 
that we will come to appreciate the one the Father has set apart as his very own and sent into the world for our sakes. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray again, thanking you for your mercy that we may freely come into the presence of the one true living God for the sake of your Son, whom you set apart and sent into the world for us. And in his name we come and ask you that you would grant us a great measure of your Spirit this morning, so that we may understand your purposes in dealing with us in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. O oh, Heavenly Father, we pray again that you will just deal with us so that it may be true for every one of us that our faith is in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Oh, have mercy, we pray in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, you might have gleaned from uh, my calling upon the Lord and asking him to bless us all, that our understanding of the Lord Jesus, who he is, and what he was sent into this world to do, is vital. In fact, it may be summed up in this way. There are only two kinds of people in this world. Those who know God in and through the Lord Jesus and those who don't. That categorization describes everybody who has ever breathed air in this beautiful blue planet which God created in the beginning and created so that we might live on it we made in his image to reflect his glory. And God's purpose for us is that we might truly know him in and through the Lord Jesus. Did he not say to Philip, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. And we're going to get there in due course as we continue, Lord, helping us our studies in John's Gospel. And so... We need to take to heart, every one of us, this morning, who the Lord Jesus is and who he is for us. And in theology, in uh, the long, big, thick books of theology that you may from time to time use as reference books or browse in, this subject is called Christology. In other words, the study of Christ, just as geology is the study of the earth, and anthropology is the study of man. Well, Christology is the study of God's Messiah. And the Greek word for Messiah is Christ, Christos. And this study is vital because on this hangs everything to do with the glory of God and the salvation of the Church of Jesus Christ. There is indeed nothing more important that we can give attention to than our own knowledge of and acquaintance with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many theologians who have done remarkable things in writing books, very profound books, dealing with this subject of Christology. One of the best books ever written, uh, published about 20 years ago, uh, we cannot stock in our bookshop because the author is an apostate unbeliever, though he is a famous theologian. Uh, it's a very sad thing, but that brings home to us a very important point. It's not merely your knowledge of the Lord Jesus, it is your acquaintance with him, your knowledge of him, that is vital as to whether you know God and whether you glorify God in the life he has given you, or whether indeed you are still lost without God, without hope in this world, because truly you do not know the Lord Jesus. So it is possible to know many things about him and not actually to know him. And it is also very possible for little children who could not give you an accurate Christological definition of the relationship of the Lord Jesus, two natures, his divine nature, and his human nature in his one person. The theologians call that the hypostatic union. Uh, 
It's a long term, isn't it? And it's a very important uh, that when you understand that, that you believe that. But of course, uh, we don't expect uh, little children to understand those complicated uh, definitions and uh, very fine distinctions between uh, various matters of essence. What's, what is the difference between nature and person? We can talk about that at the door, if you like. But little children can trust in the Lord Jesus and sing the beautiful hymn that we sang this morning, I am trusting you, Lord Jesus, trusting only you, trusting you forever, trusting you for all. Well, that by way of introduction, because it's very important that we give careful attention to this ourselves, and we're going to look at the Lord Jesus' statement this morning in verse 36, that he is the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into this world. And we're going to consider in the first place what that would have meant for these Jews who are busy interrogating him, remember, if you are the Christ, if you are the Messiah, just tell us plainly. That's what they said in verse 24. And they were impatient with him. And they were angry with him. Uh, and they soon took up stones to kill him. Uh, not once, but twice. Uh, in verse 31 and in verse 39 we read of that. They tried to arrest him. They tried to grab him. They were determined to kill him, and we see, of course, as we go on in the Gospel, that uh, in chapter 11 they began to lay very concrete plans to do just that. But they had intended to do that in chapter 5, and in chapter 7, and in chapter 8, and that's very important. So what does this mean for those Jews? Why did the Lord Jesus say this very beautiful phrase, that he is the one and only whom God set apart for himself and sent into the world. How would that have registered? How ought it to have registered with these Jews? And then we'll look secondly at how this phrase would have applied to the readers of the gospel in John's day. Because John tells us in chapter 20 and verse 21 that he wrote this whole book so that we, the readers, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that believing in him, that is trusting him, as we sang, I'm trusting you, Lord Jesus, we might have life in his name. And then, of course, we're going to look thirdly, uh, as really an extension of that, what it means for you as you sit here this morning. So these very important words, what they meant for those Jews, what they mean for the structuring and the recording of everything in this gospel and for the readers of the gospel and what they mean in particular for you sitting here in North Riding on this 25th day of April 2021. Well, what do these words mean for the Jews? They were simply the Lord Jesus answering the question, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. You see, through, as you read the scripture, you see that in the Old Covenant there is a very definite promise made that God would send his anointed one, his Messiah, into the world to deal with the world. Firstly, in rescuing a people for God, and secondly, in actually judging the world and bringing the kingdom of God into consummate into complete into wonderful expression and rightly the jews of the day identified the christ the messiah as the king of the universe the one that angels worship uh, the one who is god's answer not only for the maladies of this world plagued with sin but the one who is going to bring everything everything in heaven and earth to its right place and throughout the Old Testament, you have these wonderful promises of God sending Messiah. Beginning at the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, even as the serpent would smash the heel of that seed. And you have this expectation Growing and growing and growing. 
You have, for example, in Isaiah 42 in verse 1, God speaking from his throne in heaven and saying, Behold! In other words, take notice of, take careful notice of my servant. And that whole section that flows out of that is a description of the Lord Jesus in his magnificent working as God's servant, God's Messiah, sent into the world. And we read about him in Isaiah 49, and in Isaiah 52 and 53, and of course in Isaiah 61. My anointed one, upon whom I put my spirit, says Jehovah, and he will preach good news, liberty to the poor, to poor sinners like you and me. And of course, in Israel, there was this expectation, and you may read about it all over the Gospels, that when the Christ would come, he would be the son of David, but David's greatest son. And he would not only re-establish Israel, but Israel would be established as this great imperial kingdom to dominate the whole world, and everything would be brought to rights. Now they were scandalized, they were shocked, these Jews who are addressing the Lord Jesus here in John chapter 10, they were scandalized that he would claim to be the Christ. Because here he is. He is, as they describe him, a mere man. He is standing there. He's not ruling from a great palace. He's not subduing all of Israel's enemies, chucking the Romans, not just out of Jerusalem, but out of all of the land of God's promise, indeed, destroying them in all the world and taking over their empire and ruling, as it were, in their place. And the Jews are not being exalted as the sub-rulers under the Messiah. They think that it's absurd. And of course they want to get him to say, I am the Christ. And he does. But he doesn't use exactly those words. He says, I am God's son, I am the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world. I am what you are looking for in completely the wrong way. And they take up stones to stone him when he says that he is the good shepherd. Those beautiful words we gave attention to last time we were considering John chapter 10 three weeks ago. I am the good shepherd. And the Good Shepherd, who knows his sheep, who calls them by name, who gives us eternal life. No one can snatch us out of his hand. And as he says in verse 29, his Father, who has given us to him, is greater than all. No one can snatch us out of the hand of God the Father. Well, the Jews pick up on that. They pick up stones to stone him because he goes on to say, I and the Father are one. And they say, you're claiming to be God. You are claiming that you are equal to God. And the Lord Jesus answers them in a most intriguing way. He never denies, not anywhere in John's Gospel, that he is indeed equal to God the Father. He is God of God. And that's why John introduces this Gospel. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, God the Son, under, as it were, the command of God the Father, actually created this vast universe in His great power. And John introduces his gospel that way. And then as the gospel proceeds, you see again and again and again how the Lord Jesus, in his teaching, especially in the opposition that's coming to him, is confirming these truths. But it's very interesting as he answers the Jews, he is not taking up the question of whether he is equal with God. He is concerned with a more pressing issue that they need to come to terms with. That is that he is God's Messiah sent into the world to have a people. 
to rescue a people for God himself. And so that explains why he doesn't say, yes, I am equal to the Father, and then slip away and not get stoned. But he answers them in a very Jewish and even a rabbinic way when you think about it. Now the rabbis were excellent in this time, this time of the first century, and the centuries that flowed out of it, of making very clever and careful observations about the scripture and answering things indirectly. And that often was the Lord Jesus' way. It's interesting how often he doesn't answer a question directly, but he goes to the heart of the matter. And you see that in John chapter 3, very brilliantly portrayed as Nicodemus comes with words of flattery. And the Lord Jesus tells him he needs to be born again and doesn't pay any heed to his flattery. And it's constantly his way, that's the way he deals with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He addresses the poor man who was healed uh, in John chapter 5 in those terms. He addresses the crowds that follow him because they want more of his miraculous bread in John chapter 6 in that way. I am the bread of life, he says. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is very typical of the way he deals with people. And when it comes to the controversy in John chapter 7 and 8, the Lord Jesus does much the same. Before Abraham was, I am, he says. And they see that, of course, as a claim to be divine. But they can't grab him then. And so it is in his response to his healing of the man born blind in chapter 9 and everything that's come out of that into chapter 10. Well, here he answers them in a very similar way. And what does he say? For which of my miracles, for which of the works that I've been sent to do are you stoning me? What category of miracles has been offended, has offended you? And of course, he's healed that man born blind. And they were very embarrassed by that, right? So they answer, no, no, we're not stoning you because uh, you've done these things. No, 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 we're stoning you because you claim to be God. See that in verse 33? You, a mere man, you're making this ridiculous claim. And how does the Lord Jesus answer that? Well, he quotes from Psalm 82 and verse 6, where the Lord is indicting the judges in Israel who did not do their job. And God from heaven says, you are gods. And see how the NIV has that uh, in uh, inverted commas and with a small g. And it's because the judges in Israel exercised a function under God. Just as the Lord God gave his law to his people and he applied it to their lives in the book of Deuteronomy, the judges in Israel had an ongoing task of taking God's law and applying it to the lives of God's people. And so they had what might be seen as a divine function. And so he addresses them in those terms and rebukes them there. And the Lord Jesus picks up on that, you see, and he says, okay, well, if the scripture, if the scripture which cannot be broken does that, why are you saying I'm blaspheming? And he focuses on the fact that he's been sent from the Father. He is the one and only Messiah into the world, set apart to deal with people in their great need. Now what is the Lord Jesus doing for these Jews? He's pointing them to himself so that they may believe and believing they may have life in his name, notwithstanding the fact that they want to kill him. It's a most wonderful thing. He's not uh, changing the subject so as to bring some red herrings, as it were, into the conversation and then... Um, you know, escape with his life. No, 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 no. As you read and think and meditate on this, the Lord Jesus has a concern for them. And we do read in the book of Acts that some of these very ones, these Jews, these Pharisees, came to trust in the Lord Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. And Nicodemus himself, we read by the end of the gospel, is a disciple of the Lord Jesus. It's wonderful. And as we said a couple of weeks ago, you must not be ashamed, 
even in the face of great opposition, to bear faithful witness to who the Lord Jesus is. And so he tells them, I am the one the Father set apart. I am the one he sent into the world. That's what they need to come to terms with. And when they do, oh, then their hearts will be gloriously open to see that he is in fact equal to God the Father. That he is in fact the answer from heaven for all the needs of everyone. Well, our second point then brings us to consider how this is very important in John's Gospel because we're right in the middle of the Gospel here. And as I said earlier, John's purpose in writing this Gospel is so that we who read this life-giving word from heaven might believe that Jesus, this man who was born in Bethlehem, hidden in Egypt, grew up in Nazareth, this man who taught a group of unknown people from the back of beyond, from the region of Galilee, and called them disciples, that he in fact is God's own Messiah, who is the King of the universe, and that we are to believe in him, we are to trust in him, and we are to have life in his name. What kind of life? Well, as we were saying in one of our recent Bible studies, eternal life, the life of Christ living in our own hearts, as it were. We are united to him by this faith. We come to know him in his glory at the right hand of the Father in heaven, as the ruler of the universe, as the one who holds us in his hand, as the one who loves us and cares for us, the one whom to know is to know the Father, and to know the Father is to have life everlasting. Well, John is very concerned that the readers should see these great eternal truths. And so it's very fascinating, and here perhaps is the best example, but there are, this whole gospel is, is literally full of examples of how Jesus proclaims the truth about himself again and again when he is being attacked and his miracles are being attacked and the work the Father has sent him to do is under attack and he defends himself again and again. So in John chapter 5, when he told that man who had been paralyzed all those years lying at the pool of Bethsaida to take up his mat and walk, remember how the criticism arose Against, first of all, the man. What are you doing? It's the Sabbath. You can't carry your bed on a Sabbath. What nonsense that was. And the Lord Jesus defends himself. And he says, my father's been working. And I too am working. And they take offense at him right there because he calls God his own father, making himself equal to God. And he doesn't back away. But he tells them the truth. And... He tells them in John chapter 7 that if anybody believes in him, if your trust is in the Lord Jesus, streams of living water, as the scripture has said, will flow from you. You will be alive in Christ. And you won't be keeping this to yourself as some secret knowledge. You will be communicating, as it were, the life of Christ that is in you to people all around you. It's a wonderful thing it's that the gospel really works where Christ is really trusted and believed. And so John is developing this theme in his gospel. And here in a sense it comes to a climax because after this in John 11, as the Lord Jesus raises Lazarus, he's now teaching his friends and disciples that he is the resurrection of the life and the life. And in John 12, uh, there's a small interlude where the Jews are opposing him, but that leads very quickly on into chapter 13 all the way to 17, where he teaches this, his disciples the most beautiful and intimate things about himself. And so we see that these truths that he's been holding out, the truth about himself that he's communicated to these enemies, he's going to underscore and write in brilliant as it were, golden letters in the hearts of his disciples. 
And so at this point in the gospel, you are ready to learn of him. What does it mean? What does it mean that he is the one and only who has been set apart by the Father and sent into the world? And so I think if you can put yourself back into the, probably the, the 70s or the 80s of the first century, imagine getting a copy of this book and reading it for yourself for the first time. When you come to these words from the Saviour's lips, if you're ready to believe in him, you think, wow, this is a most marvellous truth, isn't it? Are you saying that God in all eternity set apart God to come into the world? Sent into the world on a mission, is that what you're saying? Yes, indeed, that is what our Saviour is saying. And these truths are so beautiful that we will never fully understand them or appreciate them. Not now in this life, nor I think for all eternity. I think we will be like the angels who long, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, who just long to look into these deep gospel truths. What has God done? He so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have life eternal. No one has seen God at any time, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And having perhaps just tried to travel back in time, to read these words and to try and get a sense of them hitting you for the first or the second or the third time in all their freshness and all their power, I think you're in a helpful position to start asking yourself some very poignant questions right now. You see, the question arises for us. Do you know? Do you appreciate do you honour, do you worship, do you embrace, do you trust, do you cling to this mere man, as the Jews called him, who is in fact God's Messiah, not a mere man, a true man, but also God, come in the flesh to rescue you. What difference does it make to you that Jesus Christ was sent into the world. Do you have a response that is anything like these Jews living on the other side of the Jordan? We read that in verse 40 and onwards at the end of this chapter. And it is an interesting thing that John records that material here. He says that having now dealt with the Jews in Jerusalem, Jesus leaves there. And where does he go? Well, he would pass through Jericho almost certainly and then cross the Jordan River. And he goes to the place where John had been baptizing in the wilderness. Now, the Jews who lived there were not Judean Jews. <laughs> they were not the elite. They were scattered. They were living amongst Gentile peoples, just as the Jews living in Galilee were. Galilee was called Galilee of the Gentiles. Well, this region was called Perea. And was under the rule of a different governor. And it was far from where you would expect the Messiah to be doing his work. But he goes there. And what does he find? Many people come to him. They were those who would have heard John say, This is the one the Lamb of God sent into the world. They would have heard John's disciples report how John had said of himself, I must become less and he must become more. And so they hear him gladly. And hearing him gladly, they believe in him. And it's very interesting that just before he was crucified, Jesus went back there. We read this in the other Gospels. And it was from there that mothers brought their children to Jesus to have him touch them and bless them. And it was there that, of course, the disciples rebuked those mothers. Don't bother the master. He's busy. Oh, how stupid they were. How much like us they were. But Jesus has a reception there. 
And we read in John chapter 1 and verse 12, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them right to be called the very children of God, as he was a, the Son of God, set apart and sent into the world. So those who believe him are sons of God in union with him and have all the rights to know and love God and to be called the very heirs of God himself. And that's what we're going into heaven for, to inherit everything that God has for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to ask ourselves, as we're thinking about these things, do you believe in the Lord Jesus? And what do you believe in him for? And what difference does it make? That's why John has written this gospel, and that's why these truths are recorded here. And we have to take them home to our hearts, otherwise we're just being vain religious people. As the scripture says, these people worship me in vain. Their rules are just rules made by men. We could easily be a church like that, couldn't we? We could meet, we could come together, we could feel very nice as we sing songs together. Oh boy, we could get a band in here like uh, is so popular these days and we could give you feel-good messages and you could go home and we could have a great time. And what would we actually accomplish? Nothing. What is the church about? What is the church's mission? The church is the fullness of Christ, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And the church has the same mission that the Lord Jesus came into this world for. He was sent into this world to make God known in and through himself. And the church has the duty of making God known in and through the Lord Jesus. And so the question has to be pressed on us all. What difference does it make to you that you believe in the Lord Jesus? Or at least that's your claim. Let me illustrate this for you. Tonight we're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper. It's a wonderful thing. The simple act of eating a piece of bread and drinking wine is to the hearts of real believers a sign, a seal from heaven itself, given first by the Lord Jesus to his disciples and then practiced in the church, exercised in the church as from the Lord of glory in heaven where he assures you, as you taste and chew and swallow, that he is there for you. That he died for you, that he rose for you, that he's exalted to the right hand of the Father for you. And the reality of the truths of the gospel are sealed to our hearts. And we come together to have the Lord's Supper to have dealings with him. The Lord's Supper is not a maudlin business of remembering him, hanging on a cross and feeling sorry for him because he suffered so much. That's a terrible distortion. The Lord's Supper is a sign from heaven that you can trust the Lord for everything because he did not spare himself he gave himself up for you as the Father sent him into this world to die in your place. And what you believe about him is not pie in the sky by and by. What you believe about him is concrete and real because the bread that you eat and the wine that you drink is as real as he is. In fact, he is the one who is dealing with you. And we read that, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you have any questions about that, where Paul is rebuking the Corinthians for going to these idol feasts. What are you doing, he's saying? How can you do that? And he rebukes them and he says, when we come to the Lord's table, we commune with the Lord. How can you do that with the Lord and with these demons who lie lurking behind these horrible idols? And it's a wonderful thing that we have that teaching in God's word in light of opposition to heresy and to sinful practice and behavior in the Corinthian church. But it's there. 
cup of thanksgiving which we drink, is it not communion with Christ's own blood? Asks Paul. It's a wonderful question. Now I ask you, you see, do you want to have communion with the Lord Jesus? Do you want to have heart dealings with him? Do you have a sense of how good God is to you in giving us these simple sacraments from heaven, baptism into Christ, the supper from heaven, to seal to us, because we are weak in our flesh, we are weak in our daily lives, to make sure that we know the certainty of the things we've been taught about him, to make sure that we know him and love him and have heart dealings with him. Do you have any sense of that? Do you have any desire for that? Do you have any hope in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you just going through your life, a Christian, but doing the best you can? Well, then I have to say, you're a poor Christian and a miserable Christian. If you're not living by faith in the Lord Jesus, who loved you and gave himself for you. He's the one and only whom the Father set apart, the only Messiah, the only answer from heaven, from God himself, and such an answer that he meets every need. But you live oblivious of him when you go to work. Are you working for the Lord? Paul takes up this question addressing the slaves and the slave owners. And he says, you who are slaves, you are Christ's freedmen. And he says, you who are free are Christ's slaves. And what's he doing? He's telling them it really doesn't matter. What you do in this life, whether you are the boss of Microsoft, boy, that'd be a great job to have, eh? Or whether you are the guy who's the janitor of the most mean office building and has to clean out and wash and unblock the toilets, it matters that you work for the Lord. His eyes upon you. He cares about you. Do you think he just cares about you to go to the cross, to die for your sins and then not to bother with you for the rest of your life? To somehow just get you into heaven? He cares for you. That's why the scripture says, cast your burdens upon the Lord in prayer because he cares for you. Do you pray about your job? Do you pray about your family? Do you want your family and friends to know him? Sent from heaven, God's one and only? Is he real to you? That's what we're saying. Well then, how do you go on holiday? Schools have just broken up. What do you want to do when you... Take time off. Is this at last your chance to indulge yourself? This is you've worked hard all year. This is a foretaste of your retirement when you can indulge yourself for all the years you have left. Is that what it's all about? Is this life running from one pleasure to another? Living for the weekends? Oh, it's Friday at last. And hating Sunday night because you've got to go back to school or work tomorrow? Is this is, are we living these pathetic, narrow, little, selfish, self-absorbed, self-indulgent lives? See, Jesus Christ is Lord of everything in your life, or he's not Lord of anything. And politics, let's talk about that. Do you ask yourself the question, what is the Lord doing as he shakes up this world in which we live? Or do you just 
express bafflement. It's all too confusing. It's beyond you. You see, the Lord Jesus is ruling over everything. He's been made head over everything by his Father. And as he sits at the right hand of the Father in the glory of heaven, surrounded by the angels, he rules over everything the scripture tells us by the word of his power. For the sake of his church. And we, if you pay any attention to anything going on in the 21st century, you'll see that the church is under pressure. The real church is under pressure and it's going to be increasing. Because people are believing all kinds of absurdities. And they don't just believe these things, they impose their beliefs. Because they do not want to bow their knee to the one living and true God. And the pressure is coming and it's coming and it's coming. And the church that we know of in our world is not standing up for Jesus Christ. The church is not described well as soldiers of the cross, lifting high his royal banner, for it must not suffer loss. The churches, by and large, are just caving in. And what is the Lord doing? He's giving us up to face the consequences of our casualness and our stupidity and our half-baked commitments. And we're being badly exposed. We're being badly exposed. And the Lord is working out his purposes. And notwithstanding all of that, his sheep hear his voice because he knows them. They follow him. He gives them eternal life and no one can snatch them out of his hand. So you see, faith is real because the Savior is a real Savior whom you may know and love and trust and you are to embrace him and adore him and honor him. This is what biblical Christianity is. This is what those simple folk experienced on the other side of the Jordan River. Many people came to him and in that place they believed in him. That's what it's all about. Now either you are in one part of all humanity as we said at the beginning or the other. Either he is the Lord Jesus, your Lord Jesus, whom you know and love and adore, and whom you want to grow for not just in this world, but in the world to come forever and ever. You want to grow in knowledge and love of him. Either he's your life, as we read in Colossians chapter 3 in the opening verses, or he's not. It doesn't matter whether your name is on a church register as a member. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past whether you've been a, a very nice person or a pathological criminal, it really doesn't matter whether you are rich or whether you are poor, whether you are young or whether you are old, whether your life has been a success or a terrible disappointment, it really does not matter. It matters that you know him and own him and have him and trust him. It matters whether he is real to you or not. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And your word to us is just like your miracles to those Jews more than enough evidence that they should believe. But oh Lord, how few believe in you. And how many have opinions about you, but have no 
life-giving trust in you and service of you. Oh, Lord. We ask very especially this morning that we may come, every last one of us here, to a true and living hope and trust and knowledge of you. We pray that uh, we will be kept from being religious and we will be granted grace to be Christians, truly under your name, under your banner, under your care and living for your glory. And what we pray for ourselves, we pray for the churches of Jesus Christ that we know and love, our dear brethren down the road in Cosmos City and uh, our dearly beloved brethren in Atel and uh, in Australia and England and the States and beyond. Oh Lord, you have your people and we pray that more and more you will have our whole hearts. But we also pray for those churches uh, that have denied the faith and denied you and blasphemed you, Lord, and opposed you. And we ask that in your wrath you will remember mercy. Oh, Lord, we look to you. And we are like the disciples. We confess gladly that you have the words of eternal life. To whom else can we go? We look to you and pray you will hear our earnest cry this morning. 